A few years ago, The Economist published a study by Oxford University that essentially said that 47% of all jobs in the world today will be replaced by robots and machines in the next 20 years. And suddenly, we quickly, as society, divided into two groups. Most of us went straight into denial, and then some of us went into panic mode. What will happen to your job? Will you be replaced by a machine? If you're a telemarketer, an accountant, a banker, a lawyer, a teacher, I think we need to have these discussions and to be empowered to take on skills in an age of automation. Let's look at an example. Earlier this year, a professor at Georgia Tech University announced a new teaching assistant called Jill Watson. And Jill was a very, very efficient and very good TA immediately answering every question the students had within milliseconds. Some students were a bit surprised by such efficiency, but not so surprised when at the end of the semester, the professor told them that in fact, Jill Watson was not a human being, but an artificial intelligence chatbot. And many commented then that then it made sense. And then soon after, a few months later, there was another announcement that a law firm had hired the first artificially intelligent lawyer called Ross. What does Ross do? Ross can search cases for precedence in a fraction of the time that law students can do or graduates of law schools can do. And so many feared that this would mean the end of lawyers and jobs for lawyers. But we are not like that as human beings. We tend to adapt to new situations. In fact, many law schools in the US now just don't teach constitutional law, contract law. They also teach technology. This is an article from the New York Times which literally is questioning this is law school because they're being taught data science, data analytics, how to work with machines such as Ross. This is another one in the Wall Street Journal. And one of my friends who is a professor at Yale Law School said that one of the most popular courses at Yale Law School is robotics, law, and artificial intelligence. So the education system is fast adapting in many countries. But we won't only have artificial intelligence bots, we'll have robots, robots such as Baxter. I really like Baxter. And the reason is because he is, compared to many of the huge robots that we see in car factories, like the BMW factory in Munich, he's affordable for small business owners. In fact, in the years that I've been studying him, his price has been going down from 30,000 to 28,000, 26,000. Now he costs $22,000. And he's not just an affordable robot for a small factory. He also is a social robot, which means that he was designed by Rethink Robotics to have expressions. He can smile, his eyes can move, and in fact, as he stands, next to factory workers such as this woman, um, these women and men have said that he's actually rather pleasant to work with. Could she lose her job to Baxter one day? Probably. But there will be new jobs that she can prepare herself for. What will they be? Virtual reality is just one of the fields that is rapidly growing. It's supposed to be between virtual reality and augmented reality, an industry of over $150 billion after 2020. Imagine that you want to learn about seahorses and you're in school. Well, don't just read a textbook, don't just see a video. Imagine if they could appear in front of you and you could go around them, just like these children are doing. That is the promise of one magic, um, one virtual reality company called Magic Leap in Silicon Valley. What would it do to entertainment? Don't just go to see a James Bond movie. Put on your VR glasses, strap yourself in the Aston Martin, and be James Bond and have an interactive virtual experience. That sounds like a lot more fun. But who's going to design all of these? A virtual 
reality experience designer. There are going to be more and more jobs for this field. Let's take another field. 3D printing. When 3D printing is done at the industrial level, it's called additive manufacturing. The demand for additive manufacturing skills has gone up by 2,000% between 2010 and 2014. 3D printers used to cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, but now you can buy one for a couple of thousand dollars. I'll tell you what still costs money, Stratus's 3D printers that print in multi-materials. But last year at MIT, this printer was created for just $7,000, and it can print 10 materials at the same time. So technology is moving fast, and in its wake, it's creating a lot of new jobs. Even children will be exposed to it. The toy maker Mattel has recently announced that next year, it will have a 3D printer that costs just $300. And instead of giving your children lots of toys, you could just let them print out any toy that they wanted themselves on Christmas Eve. What about another job? And there are many. I'm just covering a small subset of them. What about a geneticist? Or what some people like to call baby designer? Now we have gene editing technologies like CRISPR. What if we wanted to change certain genes in our baby when it was but an embryo in the mummy's tummy? Should we do that is different than could we do that. And the fact is that when it comes to eliminating certain diseases through genetic engineering, definitely there'll be jobs. But you'll also eventually find demand for people who don't want their children to have a gene for baldness or they want a child to have a gene for mathematics or musical ability. The problem or the dilemma with some of these jobs is that where technology brings new opportunities, it also brings us questions about how we should actually conduct those jobs. But these are, again, things that we should be discussing with each other all the time. So how should we prepare for such jobs? How should we prepare to work with such technologies? How should we prepare to actually have the skills necessary for entirely new industries? And I'm going to start with this child, because our tendency is to look at ourselves and to think, how will I prepare, or my colleagues, my children? But we are a small, elite group in the world. A lot of people live in a world of poverty and inaccessible, um, and it's inaccessible to real skills and education. This is a common picture for anybody who's lived in India. A small child is a mechanic. On the side of the road, you'll always see a child like this in one of the major cities in India. But he's locked in social immobility. There is no way this child could have competed with you or your child to go to a top school anywhere in the world. That's about to change. A few years ago, Sebastian Thrun, who was one of the designers of the first driverless car at Google, opened up a course called Programming a Robotic Car. And it was absolutely free. Now think about a course like that, plus think about the declining cost of 3D printers, and then think what that child could do with such a course. And compare that to what a child in Singapore can do, a child who has equal access to the same technologies. I would say they can become collaborators, competitors. Whatever it may be, it has become a level uh, that is the same. But Sebastian Thrun went further than that. He said that it's not just good enough to have academic skills, as we heard earlier, but it's important to have skills that get you jobs. So when that child grows older, he can take a course like this, self-driving car engineer. This is a nine-month course. It can be taken for $2,000. And the most important thing is it is validated by industry partners, such as the Chinese car sharing company Didi, uh, Germany's Mercedes-Benz, and a number of very prominent automotive industry players. 
And all of them have said that for the top graduates of these courses, no matter where they are in the world, they will give them a job. 15,000 applicants applied to be part of this course. And the first round of it is starting soon. This is the future of how we prepare for the new industries that we will encounter. But who are most motivated to do this? How many of you have taken a Coursera course? How many of you have finished a Coursera course? <laughs> I have also taken many Coursera courses that I have never woefully finished. But I'll tell you who's finishing all of them, or the majority of them. They are driven, motivated, inspiring young men and women from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Latin America, and China. In fact, when Coursera went to raise its next round of funding, it didn't do it to expand its offerings in Singapore or London or San Francisco. It did it to cater to these populations. And then there are maker spaces. Alyssa Chumachenko is one of the world's most influential women in tech. And she started her own game design company called Game Insight. And she had a child and realized that the education system was not preparing that child for the skills of the future. So she set up a string of maker spaces across Lithuania, Latvia, the Baltics, and Russia. So you can see now that there are online courses, there are maker spaces, but there's one more thing that changes how we get educated. And that is the same type of artificial intelligence chatbot that I was talking about earlier. Bill Gates has been talking about this. What if you had a mentor, your own artificial intelligence mentor, who personalized education tips and education for you, and it, it was right there in your hands, in your mobile? And this is actually going to really change how we educate ourselves in the future. And who will be using this? Well, Two-thirds of the population of India is under 35 years of age. One billion of them will be digital. Uh, and that means that they will also be extremely motivated and driven and take advantage of this technology. So at the end of the day, I would say what this means is that our collective elite advantage, which was very unfair, is over. Now we have new colleagues. Some of them are robots and machines. And some of them are these motivated, inspiring new colleagues that we have from the developing world. And I think that's a very good thing. But regardless of how you think about education, regardless of how you get it, whether you go to a school, university, online, makerspace, you should always view it in this framework, which is three ways of looking at education. The first is homo sapien. Man who knows. The second is homo faber. Man who makes, tinkers, is creative. And the third is homo luden. Man who imagines and is playful. And this trifecta has been uh, put together by John Seely Brown, who was chief scientist at Xerox. And he said everything should be evaluated, whether it's your job or your education, under these three metrics. So if you look at what you're doing these days and you feel you're doing a lot of routine work or processing a lot of information, not being in creative enough, then you are in danger of losing your job to automation. I've been talking again about how we can make this change. There are lots of opportunities. But we need to help those that can't make this change on their own. This is Otto. Auto makes driverless trucks. And Uber bought this company for over $600 million recently. And just last week, Auto started deliveries in America. You can see there's no driver. What happens to 1.8 million truck drivers in America? Who's going to help them? Who's going to organize a way for them to move on from the jobs that they've lost? And this is not just a problem for that truck driver and his family. This is a problem for society. We know what happens to men who are frustrated, unemployed, undereducated. We've seen that story play out 
in extremism, terrorism, and militantism across the world. I like Singapore's way of dealing with this. Singapore recently announced that it would give $500 to every citizen who upskills herself or himself after the age of 25. And they encourage people to take any kind of course they want. Photography, cooking, graphic design. It's a national strategy to nudge citizens into a lifelong learning behavioral pattern and to give them the skills they need as the economy pivots towards future industries. There are also nonprofits. I started a nonprofit called 21st Century Girls because I started my career as a coder. And I always felt that girls were not encouraged to do coding. So in the last two years, we have educated over 1,000 girls in basics of computer science in Singapore. Between public and private partnerships, we can start to become empowered as a society. But these are just not enough. What's really needed is knowledge. And the problem is that most of us don't know that technology is changing fast and the jobs that we will have in the future may not be there or we may not be equipped to handle them. Early in Davos, Mark Benioff, who's the CEO of Salesforce said, every country needs a minister of the future. I couldn't agree with him more. I think we all need that. In fact, more than that, there should be a mandatory class in schools and universities and community centers where everyone gets together and talks and debates about what we're going to do to have meaningful work together in the future. I hope to join the conversation with all of you today and with society as general in Singapore. Thank you.